there's a reason why I've got profitable regenerative agriculture uh, there. It certainly needs to be profitable, but we do need to have regenerative agriculture, not sustainable agriculture, but we need to regenerate our landscapes uh, or our farms as we're going. Um, I come from central New South, well, central Tablelands, New South Wales. A couple of thousand acres there. My son, my son Nick and I run the place. Um, granite soil, I, from what I can gather from the information Joel has supplied me, it's a very similar type of soil to what you've got here. And interestingly, I, I did have some uh, similar problems to what you've got here. Erosion problems, compacted soil problems, acid soil, all of that. Um, pH is, uh, oh it was in the low fives, now it's in the mid sixes actually. No lime, I'll answer that later too, how we can do that. 650 more rainfall, fairly, a bit more evenly distributed than you fellas have got here. It's, it's fairly even, summer and, and winter. We've been in that area for a long time. Um, my great grandfather, well actually he, he came from Prussia he was in, uh, he was uh, look, digging for gold at Ballarat, actually, and when gold was there, and ended up in, up in our area. I won't go into the detail of how he ended up there. Didn't find any gold at Ballarat, though. <laughs> We've always been in Merino sheep, still are now. He, he started early with, with Merinos, and he started very early growing crops of wheat. Um, what we're doing now, we run 4,000, 18 micron uh, Merino sheep. We grow about 500 acres of crop, as in pasture crop. Um, we, we run one of the largest kelpie studs in the world, actually. Um, a little bit of cattle trading. Uh, we also run a merino stud as well. Um, and one of our enterprises is actually native grass seed. Uh, and that's happened because of the way we manage the place. Okay, for the last 60 years, uh, agriculture really has lost the plot and it's just been influenced by with monoculture crops, herbicides, pesticides and ecologically, I'm talking about around the world, the whole world, it's been an ecological disaster. Um, why we headed that way I'm not sure and which is commonly called the Green Revolution from the early 1950s on. And the problems we have in agriculture really are the solutions we have is to use more fertiliser, more herbicides, more pesticides. We rarely ever address the reasons why we need to use those, those, those uh, pesticides and herbicides. And before we go any further, I'm not an organic producer. Um, we don't use a lot of inputs now, but I'm not, an, I'm not, I'm not here prom necessarily promoting anything, and I'm not, not necessarily promoting organic above uh, using conventional products. So many of the things that you do in agriculture make someone else wealthy, not us. It's always, it seems to done, and this is not having to go at the local, uh, local supplier of products, I'm not having to go at him, but certainly, you know, we, it, we, we're the silly bunnies on the end, that the, the losers in all this all the time, and every, other, every other, other fellow seems to be making the money, not us, not us, us people on the land. So, but we don't seem to ask the questions of why we, we, need, we use high rates of fertiliser and why we use pesticides, why, why we need to use those. And so, the usual answer is we have to use high inputs to achieve good production. That's the fairly normal thing that, that is said and that seems to be true. But why do we need high inputs to achieve good, uh, good production? In 1930, my father grew uh, pretty handy wheat crops, good, good wheat crops, without any pesticides. Well, there was no pesticides around then anyway. But uh, a small amount of superphosphate. But he didn't get insect attack in crop. So he didn't get, get, get fungal attacks. He just grew good crops. Um, so, why can't we do that now? Why can't we grow, grow crops now we, like he did then? We've stuffed our soil. Um, he had a lot better soils to work with. 
he had soils that were created by grasslands for many thousands or millions of years. Now, a lot of the problem here is why agriculture is crashing has not, nothing to do with lack of fertiliser. It's because our farms don't fu function in an ecologically sound way. Our farms should function as ecosystems. No one ever talks about ecology and farming together in the same sentence. But that's why, like, lack of ecological function are the reason why our soil carbon levels are dropping and so why we have to put on more fertiliser, why we get insect attack and we have to put on more insecticide, why, why we get crop disease, we've got, we've got to put on more fungicide. There seems to be a bit of a pattern here and which is we've got to put more and more product on, which I love to call the moron principle, <laughs> which is that's about what it is. We don't necessarily need those things and we can get off them and still be pro more profitable or very profitable. And it's, it's mostly related to ecology or, or, or at least ecological function. So we've done major damage to our soil, and ha but how can we improve it? How can we increase carbon levels, soil structure, water holding capacity, all of that? Plowing soil to grow crops has been practiced for thousands of years. Um, the Egyptians were plow plowing, um, originally started in Mesopotamia, where our farming uh, systems were developed about 10,000 years ago. <coughs> so why do we plough? We plough, there's good reasons why we plough. I mean, we wouldn't be still doing it, wouldn't be doing it for 10,000 years if there wasn't a reason to do it originally. It's like to control weeds, better germination, conserve moisture. The main, the main benefit we get from ploughing is actually releasing nutrients and especially making nitrogen available. That's about the only real benefit actually. So we kill everything to grow the crop. That's basically what we do and have for a long time. So all of those things that destroy soil, stru soil structure, kills microbes, all of that causes erosion, uh, causes acid soil. It's a, it really, ploughing is a disaster, really. Um, you can see it in that photo there. Same soil, just, just about five or six metres apart. Uh, and, and so basically that's just no carbon left in that soil. Hard, compacted, lifeless soil. But there's also problems with using herbicides, or at least high rates of herbicides. D similar problems, kills microbes, so, uh, pollution problems, human health, uh, kills perennial grasses, which I'll get onto later. So, okay, pasture cropping, and what I, uh, what, what I, I guess I developed, how did it happen? To tell this story, we need a, a bit of a history lesson, at least what happened on my place. Um, my father started growing, and I, I have shortened this a bit, my great-grandfather was growing wheat in the 1860s, but industrialised agriculture started with my father in the 1930s, and he started growing wheat. It was very profitable. Um, it was far more profitable to grow wheat in that era than, than uh, it, it, uh, it was for, uh, than, than sheep and wool were worth. So he farmed the place for 20 years straight. Um, and he stuffed it in that period. Um, if you take note there, that eagle, that's an eagle uh, shot and hung on the fence. Um, that's taken exactly the same spot where my father was standing in that crop that was six foot high. Uh, exactly the same spot, but about eight or nine years later. Uh, and a gully through it, that gully ended up getting 10, 10 or 12 feet deep. So he did a lot of damage in that period and he was quite shocked by it he, he, when he realised the damage he did. And he got to a point where the soil could, would no longer grow crops. Um, it, it basically, the term used then was farmed out, country, but basically it was microbially dead and nutrients weren't cycling. It was dysfunctional soil. So my father fixed the problem, so he, he filled the gullies in and, and, and re sowed pastures. He was very much a pioneer in the high input or the, the, the pasture improvement phase. I grew up in high, high input agriculture. That's what I learned when I was younger. 
So he began innovative uh, fertiliser programs. Um, he started shorter fallow periods as well as to avoid erosion. He was a very innovative farmer, my father was. Um, so this is the, the place from 1950 when he, when he really got into fixing it. Um, also an introduced pasture, clover, eyegrass, all that stuff, just in 1950. Uh, annually fertilised with, which was 100 weight to the acre, 125 kilos per hectare, ploughing, cultivating his crops and set stock grazing. That system worked very well in that era. It was very profitable in that era. There was nothing wrong with it in that era. It was recommended, it was the best science at the time and it was very innovative at that time. But over time, the place became weedy and unproductive. Um, and on today's figures, if I was doing what my father was doing, it would cost $80,000 a year on over the place to, to, to maintain what he was doing or do it the same way. Um, so, but what my father was doing in that era started to crash in the 1970s. Fertiliser costs became too high. It was basically cost was starting to, to, uh, to, to beat my father in that era. We had poor soil structure, that was, so the, the soils became acidic. We had salinity outbreaks all over, all over the place. Uh, trees dying, going broke. It's a very similar story wherever I go around, not only this country, but around the world. Um, nothing different in that, it's what's happening everywhere. But my father, it happened at home earlier, I think, because my father was very innovative and he started earlier in industrialised agriculture and it crashed earlier. That, that's probably the main reason it, um, it happened there. So, what's changed? Well, bloody nothing really from my father's era. We're still, we're still growing crops the same way. We're, if we're not ploughing, we're still nuking country with, with, with pesticides and growing crops. We're still destroying our grassland or our pastures in that uh, in also. So nothing much has really changed. We've just got bigger machinery and do it, for, and we stuff the country far more effectively. That's about the main change. Um, we, you know, we, can, we can destroy more country. So there is a desperate need to change what we're doing uh, because agricultural techniques are failing all over the world. They're just simply not working. We're, we're propping them up, you know, we're propping them up with, now with genetically modified plants. Yeah, that'll fix it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it it's no, no different than what my father was doing. It's just another technology fix. But how do we change? We've got to have an answer to this. And I'm, I'm going to talk about what I did at home. It's not necessarily the answer, it's just an, a, an answer that I found and, and to get off this, this, this uh, the treadmill that we were on. So why do we farm the way, way we do? We only ever work with the knowledge that we have. We originally farmed like Europeans. Changing is always difficult. The problem with change is that if we change, we, we actually have to admit to ourselves that just maybe we've been doing it wrong for the last 30 years. So that's a big thing to get over. Of, of, you know, so change is not that simple because we've met, we have to admit to ourselves that maybe we've done it wrong. This one is, is also interesting. Science, the advice in science is not always correct. My father used the best science that he, for his era. That was, was recommended, promoted, the best science available, and it crashed on him. So the science isn't always correct. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with science, but it's not always correct. So how do we fix these problems and be profitable? We have to be profitable in, in this. Um, how and why did I change? To start with, the cost of production in the 1970s was becoming high and, it was, and it, was, it was really difficult to be, to be profitable. But we had a major fire in 1979. We lost just about everything. 3,000 sheep, house sheds, just about everything gone. Virtually all the fencing gone. Um, instant broke. <laughs> instant broke was a, 
in the 1979, it was a, you know, basically a million dollar fire. So you go from going well to instantly broke. So uh, I had to find another way of doing it. And we talk now a lot about uh, low input agriculture, but I had no choice. I had to have no input agriculture. I didn't have any money at all. So I started to work out how I could do this without any money or any inputs. Uh, it was just a survival thing. So I looked in the 1980s, I was looking at how we could do it, low, whoops, low input. I stopped using pasture fertiliser. The, 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 the fertiliser, superphosphate, it went instantly. And we haven't used superphosphate on the pastures since 1978 actually. Um, been no, no fertiliser put on pastures at all in the, since that time. Um, I did focus on ground cover, I don't know why, no one was really promoting ground cover at that time. I did look at time control grazing in the, 19, in the 1990s and then pasture cropping, but I, what I actually did in that era, I started focusing on grassland and I was looking at natives, native species. The main reason was I knew that the native grasses didn't need the high rates of phosphorus that the ones we, were, we had before, the ryegrass and clovers and, um, and those. That was the only reason. I had, remember I had to do this with no money. So why would you bother to restore, uh, to restore a grassland? And which is, so our, our grasslands consisted of up to a couple hundred species, including around here. There was, there was at least 200 species Different species will grow in the summer, different ones will grow in the winter. So, and we also have forbs and herbs as well. I'll cover that a bit more later. Um, most of our pastures now, especially in this part of the world, consist of a few winter species, uh, uh, cool season, as in species that grow through the winter. In these areas, most of the warm season grasses have been lost. They certainly were here. Um, and they will grow here. We keep getting told in these areas that they won't grow, uh, but there's plenty of them along the roadsides. Um, okay. The reason I've got this up here, it is related to pasture cropping, um, but it's basically how, how uh, warm season and cool season grasses grow. Um, basically in the cool seasons in, in that, that curve there. Uh, and, and the warm season ones in, in, in the summer. That's it. So there's an overlap. This isn't a talk on native grasses. The, the, this, we, we, need our, uh, 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 we don't need to have all native, native grasses on our places, we, we, but we do need to have our pastures functioning like our grasslands used to function. We don't need to have any native grasses on there, but we need to get away from this ryegrass clover yeah, and, and phalaris, sort of a, a mixture. Uh, we need more than that in a pasture. Um, we certainly need our, our pastures to function like a grassland. And, and diversity is the key to that, plant diversity. Um, when we start to get, get uh, our pastures functioning as grasslands, we'll have less weeds, we need less fertiliser, more production, Resilience, we'll get through these dry times a lot easier. Drought tolerance, and, and we will start to build uh, soil, soil carbon as well. Okay. So how, how do we stop killing plants and restore grasslands? How do, we, how do we, it's okay to stand up here and do that. We don't necessarily have to sow them. Um, we can manage with what we've got. And remember, this is all about doing this without money and both Graham and I have got nothing to sell you. We got, we got, <laughs> we're different to many, most people, someone's got something to sell you. <laughs> We've got nothing to sell you. Um, to start with, we need to match, match uh, plant species to rainfall. This is about getting, getting production as, 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 as well as profit. Got a series of four slides here. Um, a rainfall event, confused, going in 2012, 40 mil of rain, a bit similar to what you sort of we, we've got now, but, but earlier, it was in February, these, in this series of photos. 
Now, this photo here was taken on my neighbour's place, and because I'm about 10 hours away, I can tell you who my neighbour is. My, my neighbour's my brother. And my brother farms exactly the same way as I used to and my father used to. So it's really an interesting comparison. So this is on my brother's place after that rainfall event. That's mainly Cape, uh, no, it's not Cape Wind, uh, wrong time of the year. Uh, it, it's mainly Cathead and those summer, summer weeds. This is on my place, same day, sorry. Virtually through the fence. I went back to take the photo, this next slide, about six weeks later, and I found my brother had sprayed his paddock out, stuffed my photo opportunity, and I thought, bloody hell. <laughs> so I didn't tell him I was taking photos of his weeds, uh, not to spray it, not to spray it. And uh, then I realised, well, hang on, that's exactly what we do. We've got even weeds there, we'll spray them out. Um, so he sprayed his weeds, went back and took this photo of mine, and the, and the feed was just about to, to the fence. Now, this photo is not about whether I could grow more feed than my brother. The only difference here is that my brother had pad weeds in his paddock when I had perennial grasses that grew on that rainfall event. That's really all it is. So it's about species diversity, really. Um, so, so in there, they're, they're, it, they're mostly native, but they don't have to be. There's about 50 or 60 species of, of native uh, grass and forbs and plants in there. Okay. And they all come from just the way you've managed your land? Yes, none of them have been, none of them have been sown. They, they, they have, that's part of this story. The, those grasses there, wherever it is, uh, have, have returned because of the way, way that it's been managed. None have been sown. Um, now, Graham covered this a bit, but it is relevant to that photo at my brother's place. Most of our farms are now dominated by annual weeds. And basically, we get what we, we manage for. Most of our farms are, are functioning about here. What's interesting is, when, when a pre-white pre, pre man, when, when, in Aboriginal management, Aborigines manage for here. They actually manage for grasslands. Who are the smart ones? We manage for weeds, they manage for here. I mean, maybe we can learn a bit here. Uh, so, but that's pretty well. Most places are, are, are managing for about here, and certainly the place at home was. My place was, was here. Uh, and my brother's place still is about here. That's, we, get for, we get what we manage for. So if we've got our places that uh, we, uh, are weeds, like my place was, I was obviously managing for weeds because that's what I had. Can I just ask a question? Uh, yep. What about fire management? Ah, great. Yep, yeah, good question. Well, obviously I'm worried, <laughs> a bit concerned about fire. What is interesting, most of the time at home now, in the summer, it's like that. Because these grasses are, 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 are warm season grasses that grow, grow in the summer. I might add now, and I know I get, I'll get myself into trouble for saying it eventually, but Victoria gets burnt out almost every year because we have lost those warm season grasses. It's not green in the summer anymore. There's some very good documentation, early explorers, early settlers describing the grasslands around these areas here, uh, green, green grass uh, um, you know, up to the cattle's backs, and they struggle to find the cattle in the grasslands here in Victoria, here in these areas here. You can find that, that information. So, and it, it was a grassland and it was summer grass dominated here. So, and we've lost, lost these grasses from here. Well, lost them all over Australia. But we can get them back, I mean, that's not a problem. If you ask almost everyone what native grasses are like, and they'll say, bloody useless, my cows die on it, or my sheep die on it, and, they, and a Christian was asked a while ago, they fill my sheep up with grass seeds. You know, so, okay, if you have a big table here, and you filled it up with, with, with uh, um, a whole heap of food, and you had, 
watermelon and, and cakes and ice cream and chocolates and, and all that. And you mixed it up with some, some uh, Brussels sprouts or cabbage, cabbage and, 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 uh, and spinach, all that through it. And you turned a mob of kids loose on this table full of food. <laughs> you all know which ones the kids are going to leave behind. The poor old cabbage and spinach will be, be left there. Everything else will be eaten. If you lock the kids in the room for a week, they still wouldn't eat the bloody cabbage and spinach. But that's exactly what's happened to our grassland. Like we started off with a great diversity of species, 200 species or maybe more. And the sheep and cattle, because they hadn't been managed, they just, they selectively took out all those good ones. And all we got left in our most of our grassland is cabbage and spinach. Um, and the cabbage and spinach was all, were always in the grassland, but they were, didn't dominate. So when the sheep and cattle took out those good species, that allowed the cabbage and spinach to just take off and, and, and multiply. So we end up with a whole grassland full of cabbage and spinach. We want to create as much ground cover as possible. And we can do that with the type of grazing that Graham was talking about there. Like we, we need to get the, the material on the ground. The gr we grow our own litter, really. You grow litter, get it on the ground with animals. Um, so how do we do this without costing too much money? Stop killing the plants is a good place to start. Allow the species to grow to wish to grow. And that one's difficult. People worry about weeds when you say that. And allow nature to function as it was, as it was designed to. Um, so the techniques I use to restore grassland are grazing management, uh, planned grazing that Graham was talking about. Pasture cropping will also do it. Combining the two will get far better results. So why are we talking about grasslands? So we've covered a little bit of that. Grasslands are the best benchmark we've got to model our farms on, believe it or not. We keep on getting told we need this new introduced whiz bang new, new, new uh, plant that Joe Blow and the Rural Supplies Place are selling. I mean, but mostly that's generally a heap of bullshit, really. Um, if, if the stock eat it and it grows, well, we don't necessarily need the new one at great cost. Um, we need diversity. That's the key, key to, to production, really. So if our farms function like grassland, we wouldn't have the, the, the uh, insect problems, the, the soil health disease problems, uh, and we would reduce costs and be more profitable. So, and pasture cropping requires an understanding of grasslands and how they function. That's, so all those reasons why we're talking about grasslands. Now, a little bit on grazing here, just, here just, it's not the grazing that kills the plants, it's the human managing the plants that's the problem. It's not the animals that's the problem. Um, and animals can be beneficial if they're grazed, grazed well. This is a slide which is a bit similar. Graham was talking about this. If plants are grazed, uh, are, are let grow, you'll grow a big root, root system. If they're grazed short all the time, you'll have like that, you'll, you'll have the same plant, will only have a short root system. That's what's wrong with most of our places. Most of our places, if they're grazed short, also have a short root system. So your soil structure crashes and we're not feeding soil microbes and we're not cycling nutrients because the roots aren't even up on the plants. So how do we combine livestock and grow crops? This bottle of beer, none of you here probably have seen this. Daryl Clough and myself uh, developed or thought of pasture cropping one night on the grog. We after about 10 or 12 beers You've got to be drunk to think of something this stupid, really. So that, this is a true story. <laughs> so we're on the grog one night, and um, we were already direct drilling um, at that time. In, in, the, in, in, 90, in the early 90s, we were direct drilling, but we were nuking everything with Roundup, um, and so uh, uh, that way. And we, then we started to think, well, why are we killing these plants when they're going to go dormant anyway in the winter when our, when our crops are growing? That's how the pasture cropping uh, idea, uh, where it started. Yeah. Pasture cropping is actually a land management technique. It's a bit more than just simply a, a, a way of growing crops. Um, 
It's a land management technique when we're zero tilling crops into dormant perennial grasses. Um, just to add here, people sometimes get very confused about past growing what it, what it is and what it isn't. And it can be very low input where no fertiliser or herbicide is used. It can be an organic system. But it also can be fairly high input, depending on what you're trying to achieve. If you're, try, if you're chasing grain and grain yield on crops, there's no reason why you can't use uh, a reasonable rate of fertiliser and do weed control uh, very much like a normal crop, just totally depends on what you want. Someone uh, like uh, um, trying to uh, dual purpose crops it can be somewhere in the middle. So a lot of the stuff you get told about pasture cropping being a, you know, you can't use herbicides, you can't use fertiliser, just totally wrong. I don't know where that idea came from. Um, it, and it, it depends on what your goals are, what, you, what you're trying to achieve. So why haven't plants been grown into grass before? Well, the obvious answer to that is no one ever got drunk enough before to think of something that stupid, but there's some other reasons. It, was, it is known that annual plants will compete, at, will compete with each other, like our, our crops are all annual plants, so wheat and rye grass, wheat and annual grasses, uh, th that grass will affect, affect the crop. Um, so, and and that, it was assumed that perennial plants would do the same thing. A lot of assumptions here, no one ever did the work. Um, we were that naive, we didn't know it couldn't work. That was about when we first, start, we first started. Um, whoops, everyone, many people are worried about crop disease. Um, the crop disease is not necessarily related to the plant, it's related to how healthy the soil is or isn't. We, there should be no reason why we get crop disease if our soils are healthy. Um, and no one had looked at how nature worked in, gra in grasslands. They never looked at, at warm season, cool season perennial plants. Same slide again, but we've just put a wheat crop in the middle or an oat crop in the middle. Now it doesn't always have to be that way either. Um, so, but what we're doing is combining animals. We're using animals to prepare the paddock. We're using animals to mulch, create mulch and litter that we're sowing into, very much like a veggie patch. Why do we put straw, uh, like a litter of straw on a veggie patch? Anyone got any ideas? Anyone? Yeah, yelled out. Anyone got any ideas? Why, why, why do we mulch? All the gardening shows. Conserve moisture. Conserve yep. moisture, yep. Get control weeds, yep. Yeah, they're the two main things. Feed the soil, yep, all those. Uh, it keep, keeps soil at a, at a more even temperature. It, it, doesn't, it keeps it from getting too cold or too hot. Why don't we do that out in the paddock? I mean, it should be compulsory for everyone to watch the gardening shows. I mean, and while I'm on that, we need more women in agriculture. Women are nurturers. Us blokes, we fix problems with bulldozers. Uh, women are nurturers. We need more, more of, of that nurturing influence in agriculture. Um, so, um, we know Costa tells us every Sunday how to, how to grow a veggie patch or a garden. We don't seem to apply it to, uh, to our paddocks, the same thing. So, just to go through very quickly about what, what parts of growing, we're zero tilling, uh, never ever plough, so nothing special about the technology, zero till machinery. Um, we make sure we keep the perennial plants alive. That's the main thing to focus on, really. Weeds are managed by creating litter where possible. Weeds are also managed with very careful use of herbicides if we need to. Um, and uh, pasture cropping actually is perennial cover cropping. And these are just a se sequence of slides here now of, of a couple of years ago, four years ago now, um, of, of a crop. We started with that. That's actually native grassland. Most people, you can't believe, believe that. That's, that's actually na native grassland. It's, it's primarily Warringah summer grass. But anyway, another story. There's the grassland. We actually harvest uh, native grass seed in, in many of our paddocks. This, this, this sequence, we harvest grass seed off that. Um, we mulch the paddock with sheep, in this sense sheep, 
but cattle doesn't matter with a sheep or cattle. Um, and then we sow, sow the crop into that mulch. I mean, remember I've been doing this for 20 years. You're not going to start with that much litter. But that, you don't, that's all right, you've got to start somewhere. We started with paddock full of weeds and bare ground. So but this, this is what, what we're at, at, to, at now. Um, that looks a lot like Costa's garden patch. Uh, the crop's been sown into that. There's no one standing on that hat. The, the litter isn't that thick. Um, so, the, so we've sown through there. The, the crop's emerging through that litter. It's, room, it's only a normal, normal direct drill machinery or zero drill machinery. Uh, that's the crop. The crop can be grazed at that stage. You know, it can be dual purpose crops. Um, yeah, coming up, up, up to head, harvesting the crop. Now, it just quickly, if, if you look at this, this, here, this paddock here, whoops, whoops, um, that was grazed pre sowing. Uh, we, we've, uh, we've sown that crop, got that crop. It, it, it was three tonne a hectare crop of echidna rates. Um, and if we got a really bad year and we didn't get much of a crop at all, didn't, didn't finish you know, fairly normal, I mean, that happens all the time with the dry season, what have we lost? We've got grazing right up to the point of sowing. sowing. We've got grazing, uh, like uh, we've sown the crop, we get grazing of the crop because a dry year we might graze that crop right out. We've still got all of our perennial grasses left. How can you lose? I mean, really, very, very low risk. Okay, you may, you may have lost the opportunity for the crop, but then you, that's, that's the same as any cr cropping program. So we've maintained, at least maintained, the, the, um, the, the, the perennial grasses or our pastures in that cropping process. Very, very low risk. Uh, we, we, we put a bit of fertiliser on that and we re re renovated the paddock. One thing that pasture cropping does, it, it enhances the, the grass and makes the, and we get recruitment of perennials, so it'll, it'll move the grass then forward. I'm sort of rushing through this a bit. Um, after after the, we've harvested the crop, we've got our grass then back again to graze. Then we harvest more native grass seed, or we can. Uh, so over a 12-month period, we've done, done all that. Um, We've grown that crop, we've harvested seed, we've harvested the crop and grazed it. And that particular crop had, had uh, no herbicide on it. Um, the the fertiliser we're using on the crop we've reduced by 70%. We, we used to use 100 kilos of DAP, which is fairly standard in our district, and most people are still using that, DAP or MAP, whatever. We're using about 30 kilos now. So we've reduced the fertiliser in there uh, under the crop as well. So we can produce a crops for grain or grazing. We can improve the pastures by stimulating perennial diversity. Um, it does improve soil health and increase carbon levels and it will improve the ecological function of, of the place. This is uh, what I'm developing now. This is sort of the next step. I'm always um, multi-species pasture cropping. Um, I won't dwell on it too much, but this is the direction that it, it's go, going at home and it will go around the world. Pasture cropping is adopted all around the world. That particular, that's a crop this year. I went to take a photo of it with the four-wheel motorbike and I couldn't see the bike in, in it, so I set the dog on, dog on, the, <laughs> on the bike. But that's a mix of oats, forage, brassica, vetch, clover uh, and field pea sown into a grassland. Um, if you think about that from a grazing point of view, extra quality feed, real good quality feed there from, to graze. When they take the brassica and field pea and, and, and vetch out, we can still harvest that crop because they'll graze it first. It won't recover like oats, oats will from the grazing. So we still got, can, get, can get grain off that. That's just something for you to think about, the, uh, of a direction and, and stuff you can do with this. Um, so if you relate it to that, to that, might have, this is my brother's place. Um, how much stock feed is produced on that paddock while, while it's being prepared to, to put a crop in? I mean, <laughs> I mean, and that's just a simplistic look at it. Don't they? I mean, we never, in cropping programs, we never ever count uh, the loss of production while the paddock's being prepared. 
And just some photos here now. We can grow some pretty handy crops. That's a four tonne oat crop um, of, uh, like a, of, of um, echidna oats. You can crop into, into the, uh, um, a lot of your, your cool season grasses like you've got here. It's a little bit different technique, but you can and get brocade yields. Um, that's, that's a bit of spear grass with, with, um, with um, a crop of cereal rye, that one. Um, uh, now, uh, some fellows over around Vanilla are, 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 are doing a good job with, with um, pasture cropping. Um, Russell Ellis over there is doing a doing good job, getting some quite reasonable grain, grain crops. Just some more photos here. That's, that's a wallaby grass, which is a cool season grass. The native grasses don't actually affect the crop that much at all. And I think mainly probably because they're a bit more water efficient than, so if that was a rye grass plant in there, it, it, the crop would struggle. But some of these, the, the uh, native um, cool season grasses that are grown the same type as a crop don't seem to affect the crop that much. You would get some yield penalty with it in there, but not a disaster. Um, now, where a fit is here, where you've got mainly, you haven't got a lot of warm season grasses here, and you, especially a forage, a forage um, enterprise, is simply switch it around. Like if you've got a feed gap in the summer, which often in these areas you have because you don't have a lot of perennial species then, but you've got a lot of winter ones, switch it around and you can grow a forage crop uh, in that summer period. And if you think about it as a multi-species forage crop, even better. You can have five or six species in there. Millet, cowpea, lab lab beans, whatever. You can throw some sunflowers in if you wanted to. Um, you know, uh, now the reason why we get multi-species, I did mention before, we'll, re we'll, we'll start to drive the soil and soil health and soil structure far faster than, than, a, than a monoculture crop, as well as better, better stock feed. Um, so you can think, think of switching around and, and sowing summer forage crops uh, instead of uh, at winter ones. Um, Okay, now I'm just going to get on to, just throw some ideas at you. How do we, like we keep on being told the way we're going to feed 9 billion people in, in, in 50 or 40 years or whatever it's going to be by uh, better monoculture crops and gen genetically engineered crops. That's just more of the same bullshit. I mean, it really is. There are other ways we can do it and well, I don't think we've got an option. If we continue down that why we won't have a planet to stand on, let alone feed nine billion people. So just some ideas. And so start thinking about producing more off the same area of land. And it can be done relatively easily, providing the enterprises are compatible. We know we can grow a crop into a grassland. So if you grow, like think about this, like the native grass we're harvesting, it, it, there is a future in that as a, as a food source, human food source. Aboriginal people ate, ate native grass seed for 40,000 years. So we just need to address that a bit further. And not enough work being done on that. So you, we can produce grain, any sort of grain with this grassland. We can produce any type of animal, put any type of animal on it. Um, so it's only limited by your imagination, but so what we're doing is stacking enterprises vertically on top of each other, but they have to be compatible to work. Um, and and it, it, is, it is unlimited when you, if you really start to think about it with a very open mind. Um, and that, th there's no reason why if we start stacking enterprises on top of each other that are ecologically compatible, that we will regenerate the landscape at the same time. We'll regenerate our farms. It won't go backwards. It'll just keep on improving if we get it right. Um, now, agriculture and sound ecological practices should function together. And I'll, uh, I'll give you some examples of the gains by going down that track. And this is what's happened at home. Um, on one owner, we haven't used an insecticide for, for over 20 years, we don't have insect attack in crops or pastures. Um, how, how is that possible? We've actually got 600% more insects in our pastures and there's 120 odd percent more diversity of species in there. 
It's those insects themselves that are controlling the ones, especially spiders and that type of thing, are, are controlling red-legged earth mite and those types of things. Like, you know, uh, so this spraying for, for red-legged earth mites on a, on a, on a calendar, it's, got, it's bullshit. I mean, it's never going to work. You're going to keep killing spiders and everything else. You're going to get more, more insect attack, not less. Need to get off that. I mean, don't lose a crop because of <laughs> insect attack. I mean, don't... But, but you know, we need to wean ourselves off a, a lot of this stuff. Um, we haven't sown any perennial grasses at home, um, yet we have now 60 or so species uh, in our pastures. H how's that happened? We know pasture cropping will stimulate perennial grasses, um, and it does that by with the small soil disturbance with direct drill machine, uh, root exudates, and Graham mentioned that a little bit, feeding soil microbes, creating an, envir in, in, an ideal environment for perennial plants to germinate from seed that's already in the soil. They're, like Graham mentioned, there's pr plenty of grass seed in, already in the soil, unless it's been nuked for 50 or more years, some may not, but generally there is. Um, it, it does improve soil health, and it does it change a microclimate, does create a microclimate. <coughs> Um, we've reduced fertiliser, crop fertiliser by 70% and we've used no fertiliser on, on pastures for, uh, for 30 years. You know, how can we do that? We keep on doing it, being told we've got to put more and more fertiliser on and we're going to get production. Um, there's been a lot of work done, a lot of CSIRO work, Sydney University work, um, Fenner School, uh, like heaps of research work done at home. Uh, the soil carbon has increased by 200%. Uh, our place now holds 200% more water because of that increased carbon. All of the soil nutrients, including trace elements, have increased by 172%. Now, that's without fertiliser. We keep getting told, got to put fertiliser on or the wheels will fall off or something. I mean, that's just bullshit. We don't necessarily need to put fertiliser on. This is happening over a period of time when our, so our soils are now improved and we're getting nutrient cycling and nu nutrients becoming available over time. Um, and, and the plants do that. I mean, perennial plants will drive nutrient cycling. They will actually bring nutrients up from deeper down because the roots are going deeper. Um, so, oh yes, you can, certainly do, you can certainly do that, but don't, if you're growing a crop, put on what the crop needs uh, when you first start then start to see over time whether you, if your soils are improving, you may be able to wean off some of that fertiliser, which is, that's how I did it. Okay, fertiliser doesn't have to come from a bag. I'm going to really move through this. Um, if we get our soil healthy and functioning, we can get virtually all of our nutrients uh, by management like that. Graham covered a fair bit of this. Like we can get nitrogen. We don't necessarily need legumes in a pasture. Nothing wrong with legumes, but Freely with nitrogen fixing bacteria and, and, and microbes will also make new, uh, nitrogen available uh, and all the elements available. We haven't used fungicide, we don't get fungicide uh, fung fungal problems, uh, uh, sorry, crop, crop diseases. Uh, crop diseases is just an indication of, of poor soil health. Um, there's no reason why we should get crop diseases at all. And, and, and that's how that happens is because we've got great microbial diversity. Like all of them have increased by hundreds of percent, the uh, soil microbes. Is it profitable? Now, um, uh, this is our costs uh, simplified, but uh, this is when we were on that on a high input uh, industrialised agriculture here. Uh, and now we're saving about $80,000 annually. And a lot of it is in, in, in fertiliser, less fertiliser costs. Less fertiliser, less, less um, uh, herbicide, you know, fungicides, all that stuff. Um, there's also less veterinary costs, less drenching, um, that, that side of it as well. Productive, is it productive? And this is sort of related to a question that came up a while ago. Annual income is higher. We're actually running more sheep and cattle. Certainly we're running double of what my brother is. Um, crop yields, whoops, crop yields are similar. We add to that, we're harvesting a, a thousand kilos or more of, of native grass seed. 
Um, uh, soil carbon levels are, in, are, are increasing and all the nutrients are increasing and we're spending a lot less money. Like I wouldn't be here if I continued down that track. You can't be spending that sort of money and survive. So, okay, by managing agriculture and sound ecological principles together, we can improve all of these. We can improve soil carbon and water holding capacity. We can improve nutrient availability and cycling. We can improve plant and animal diversity. We can improve plant and animal disease. We certainly can improve soil health and profit. But we can't do all that if we keep doing what we've already done. We know that it hasn't worked. The wheels have fallen off what we've been doing or the way we've been doing it. So agriculture can be more profitable and it can regenerate our, our farms. But we, agricultural practices need to function closer to how nature had it designed in the first place. And that's it, thank you. Thank you.